1 Corinthians 13, 11 says, when I was a child, I spoke as a child. I understood as a child. I thought as a child. But when I became a man, I put away childish things. There's another translation in the New Living Translation that declares it this way. When I was a child, I spoke as, excuse me. When I was a child, I spoke and thought and reasoned as a child. I spoke and I thought and I reasoned as a child. But when I grew up, I put away childish things. For the sake of today's theme, Will you look at somebody and say these three words? Repeat after me. Say, watch your mouth. Listen to me. Yeah, yeah, watch, watch your mouth. Watch, watch your mouth. I, I don't know about you. I don't know about you. I don't know what your upbringing was like. But, um, but, but when I was a child, every now and then I, I would, um, the old school would say I would get beside myself. If you know what I'm talking about, say amen. amen. Every now and then I would get beside myself and I might say something out of my mouth that because I was a child and I didn't have the maturity to understand what I should and should not be saying out of my mouth. Every now and then an adult would address me and they would say, watch your mouth. And so I find that sometimes with my 10-year-old son, you know, when, you, you, when you've grown up a certain way every now and then you get a chance to say what was said to you when you were a kid. Do y'all know what I'm talking about? Those are the moments that parenting is made of. I'm telling you what. Every now and then you, hey, 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 because I said so. That's when you. But every now and then I, I got, I, I began saying things out of my young, immature mouth that I should not be saying. And so I had to be reminded, watch your mouth. If I may share with you, the text, as we explored last week, gives us a method to maturity. I believe that what Paul does here is he provides us with a process map to maturity, one that demands that we get ready even when we're not ready. If I can share with you, I was speaking with someone this week, and one of the things that they took away from the outside in point from last week was that God wants you right now the way that you are. And, and, and I got to tell you, that blesses me because what it says is that God is committed to guide us through our growth, even when we're not grown up yet. That, that when, look, when they said to me that God wants you the way you are right now, it communicates to me that while you and I think that we have to be this um, perfect, th th this blemishless, this ideal construct for God to be able to use us, what I learned in that is that God is committing to guide us through our growth, that he doesn't need us to pause in our pursuit of purpose. And as a result, we have to make a decision to put some child, childish things away. Will you tell somebody, stop playing? I, I shared with you last week that you have to stop playing with your words. I, I told you that you have to stop playing with your time. I said that you have to stop playing with purpose, that you have to stop playing with the power that you have. See, sometimes we get so consumed by our conflict that we don't commune with our God. We, we get worried, and if you know like I know, you know that worry is bred out of the spirit of fear. And my Bible tells me in, the, in 2 Timothy 1 and 7, somebody knows what the word said. It says, for God has not given us the spirit of fear, but of power and of love and of a sound mind. Will you say, I have a sound mind? I, I, have, a, I have a sound mind. I have, to, I have to challenge you to acknowledge that although you have some problems, you also have some power, and my power is more prevalent than my problems because 1 John 4 and 4 reminds me that I am of God, but it does not stop there. It goes on to declare that these other spirits are spirits that are not of God, that I've also got the victory over them. And then it declares that greater is he that is in me than he that is in the world. Will you say, I have a sound mind? I have a sound mind. If um, I need you guys to understand that in, in other words, and because God, 
And because God is the greatest power, we shall never ever be defeated. See, I don't know if that doesn't mean anything to you, but, but I grew up with bigger cousins. And because I thought that they were the greatest power, I was never worried about being defeated. But if you understand, like I understand, whatever my cousins had, whatever my friends had, whatever my protectors growing up had, they ain't got nothing on God. And because God is the greatest power, we shall never tell somebody, stop playing. You have to stop playing with your words. See, 1 Corinthians 13, 11 says, when I was a child, I spoke as a child, I reasoned, I thought as a child, but when I grew up, I put childish things away. Here, Paul illustrates our process. We don't always like to acknowledge the fact that our process is childish. I'm saying the way that you get to things. There's a right way to get to stuff. And there's a wrong way. Some of us are so childish that we say, well, at least I got there. Stop playing. See, Paul illustrates our process, the way you speak, the way that you understand, and the way that you think. Illuminate how you process information. So when speaking to people, you can see how they process information when you analyze the words that come out of their mouths. Because speech tells you what they understand. What they understand tells you how they think. And so Paul in 1 Corinthians 13, 11 is charging us to understand how we process information. He's charging us to evaluate the power and the progression of our ability to to process information when we review our responses to things and when you analyze your own attitude you might uncover a childish approach to processing information so when he says when I grew up I put it away the next thing that he's charging us to be able to do beyond stop playing is uh, point number two if you take points is um, he's charging us to be disloyal to dysfunction Now, I, I know what you're thinking. You're thinking, Pastor, that don't got nothing to do with me. Because I'm loyal to a lot of things. But I am not loyal to dysfunction. Can I help you understand how you might know whether or not you are loyal to dysfunction? See, the first sign that you might be loyal to dysfunction is when you use any of these phrases. That's, that's just how I am. You don't know that one? That's not you. Okay. Um, see, it can be clear when you conclude confrontational comments with, that's just how it is. Or my favorite, it is what it is. If there wasn't a phrase that don't mean more than anything, I mean, I guess it is what it is. Hear me out. If you use those phrases, especially in confrontation, these are phrases that are often associated with a loyalty to dysfunction. Because as opposed to challenging the effectiveness of our process, we concede and therefore submit to its ineffectiveness, convincing ourselves that the possibility to improve just does not exist. When I look at you, acknowledging the fact that I have flaws and I tell you I am who I am it's just how I am that is me telling you that there is no possibility at progress and so what you have is a finished product and if you don't like it then you can leave but Paul is saying we have to be disloyal it's a dysfunction. See, when I tell you it is what it is, when I tell you I am who I, how I am, when I tell you that things have always been this way, what I'm communicating to you is that I refuse to put childish things away. I am telling you that I am rooted in my dysfunction, and either you decide to subscribe to the dysfunction that I'm dishing out to you, 
or you can disconnect from me. Paul is saying we have to be disloyal to dysfunction. Paul says, when I was a child, I spoke like a child. I understood like a child. I thought like a child. But when I grew up, I put childish things away. Growing up means acknowledging that I'm not a finished product. Can I say that one more time for the perfect people that might be around? See, gr growing up means acknowledging that I'm not a finished product, that I am a lifetime learner. Just because I am this way does not mean I have to stay this way. See, growth means that I do not pledge allegiance to my problems. Growth means I don't pledge allegiance to my immaturity. Growth means point number three, tell somebody grow up. Watch your tone when you tell it to them because the person next to you might have had an argument or two with you. Look, look at somebody else, somebody that didn't come with you and just say, grow up. See, I need you to understand. <laughs> Y'all ain't going to blame it on me. Yeah, we were at church and pastor said, the way you said that to me, I mean. I need you to understand that when we were children, we would talk about what we wanted to be when we grew up. Now that we're growing and grown up, there is an expectation for us to bring those things to fruition. Nobody says this. Can I tell you, there are things that nobody says in the classroom when somebody says, what do you want to be when you grow up? There are some things that are not on that list. People, I want to be a firefighter. I want to be the president of the United States. I want to be a police officer. I want to be a doctor. Can I tell you, nobody says when I grow up, I want to be so loyal to dysfunction that it ruins my life. No, no one says when I grow up, I want to adopt a habit that tears down my family. Will you say grow up? See, see, no one says when I grow up, I want to destroy every relationship that I've ever established because I can't get out of my own way. And even though people love me because I don't love myself, I am going to insert destructive behavior into our relationship that will ultimately cause it to crumble. Nobody. If they said that in your kindergarten class. Check on that person today. I'm not. No, nobody says that. So, so I need you to say grow up. See, you have to embrace that when God called you, he called you to be able to say, when I grow up, I want to destroy generational curses. Somebody say grow up. See, when I grow up, I want to establish financial freedom and build an inheritance for my children and my children's children. Say grow up. When I grow up, I want to cultivate healthy and whole relationships. People that can grow together and communicate with one another without profaning. Will you say grow up? When I grow up, I want to raise kingdom children. I, I want to raise kingdom children that watch me growing up as they were growing up so they got a chance to see some of the obstacles that I fell into that they were able to learn from so that they could be better than I ever was, better than I could have ever imagined. Will you say grow up? Grow up. Grow up. See, I need you to understand that, that, that in order to do those things, I must be disloyal to dysfunction. And you will know that you are no longer loyal to dysfunction when you stop defending it. Ooh, I can hear it now. I know y'all. So the next time you're in a conflict with somebody, you're going to be seeing what you're doing right now is being loyal to dis. If you do it, just send me a text that say, Pastor, I said it today. I'm going to know what you're talking about. I'm already going to know where you're at. But we. We, we will know that we are no longer loyal to dysfunction when we stop defending it. The fact that you're triggered. The fact that you're triggered does not give you free reign to be disrespectful, to be unkind, to be cantankerous. Because believe it or not, all of us are dealing with our own levels of trauma. And so every now and then something happens and it builds up in you. And instead of deciding that I am no longer going to submit to the trauma, pray for me. Somebody say grow up. 
So you'll know when you're disloyal to dysfunction when you stop making excuses for coarse and chaotic behavior. Now, 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 I, I need you, can I, can I teach for a minute? If it's okay for me to teach, say, teach, pastor. Yeah. It's important for you to note that in the scripture, Paul says, when I was a child, I spoke and thought and reasoned as a child, but when I grew up, I put away childish things. Now, it's important for you to understand that the, no, the most common verb that is used for speak in the Bible, in the original Greek, is the word lego. It's where we get the term Logos. So if you're familiar with the term logos, if you're not, when John is talking about Jesus being the word become flesh, in the original Greek, he says logos became flesh, just so you understand. And so it's important to know that it derives from the word lego. And the most commonly used word to describe speaking in the Bible, in the original Greek, is used over 1,300 times. However, the word that Paul uses is a far less used word. It's used infrequently by comparison, right? That if Lego is used over 1,300 times, the word that Paul uses has only been used 295 times to describe speaking. Will you say laleo? One more time, say laleo. If I may define this right, laleo in the Greek is used to describe, to use words in order to declare one's mind and disclose one's thoughts. Say laleo. See, it's important for you to understand that you and I might merely think about speaking from the perspective of the words we use. Whereas laleo, the way that Paul is describing it, is intended to not only communicate the words that you use, but the space where the words come from. It's for that reason that Paul starts with speaking, and then he goes with thinking, and then he goes with understanding. Because the speaking is an outward manifestation of the thinking and the understanding. And so when Paul says, I spoke as a child, laleo, he's not saying, I was saying, ga, ga, goo, goo. What he's saying is, I spoke as a child, meaning I divulged information about the way my mind worked and the way that my thoughts were constructed, often, get this, to the wrong people. Anybody got, if you got kids in here, say amen. amen. Your kid ever said something in the grocery store <laughs> to the wrong person? Listen, if you haven't had it yet, give it time. But I, I'll never, I got to tell you this story, and I mean this. I got to tell you the story because it's really what happened. We were at Disney. This was November 2019. My son at the time was four, five. He was five by then. Yeah, he was five. No, yeah, five. He's five years old. Listen to this, no joke. We are in this line that was long. It was long. We were, we were in the line for three hours. We were trying to ride the... Um, Avatar ride. If you haven't been there, you got to do it. We're in line. And, um, and one of the people closest to us, one of the people closest to us, you could not, by looking at them, confirm gender. In 2024, he would have got us canceled. If you mad, see me outside. It is what it is. Ah! Follow me. We in line three hours with this person. My son is my son. Through and through. Inquisitive. Wondrous. He's been looking at this person for an hour and a half easy. And I say that because I got to give him some leeway. He gave it time. 
He gave it time to be able to somehow see something that made it clear. Finally, my young man, kindly, even a little bit considerate, looks and says, are you a boy or a girl? I couldn't have been more mortified because I don't know what I was doing, because if I saw him address the person, I already knew where this was going. I would have grabbed him by the face. You remember on movies where they put that cloth on their face and then knock them out? I would have done something. I promise. But I couldn't get there. Don't tell nobody else this story. If you're watching online, forget this. <laughs> Mortified. His intentions were pure. He wasn't saying nothing wrong. Just trying to understand. But you know how I, when you speak like a child, what's happening on the inside of you, you don't care how, to pro, how appropriate it is. You, you don't care. You don't care what environment you're in. You don't care if it's dignified. You don't care if it's respectful. And so Laleo is what happened when my son saw somebody he didn't understand in Disney. What comes out of you? We can talk about Kevin Carter, but what, what comes out of your 25-year-old mouth? What comes out of your 35, 45, 55, 65-year-old mouth when you have decided that you will be loyal to dysfunction and you won't put childish things away? So when somebody gets to tap dancing on your nerves, what comes out of your mouth? Ooh, what's your Laleo? Because Paul is trying to help us to grow up. He's trying to help us to understand that when you are thinking and reasoning and behaving in childlike behavior, there's some things for you to put away. And so, and, and so I love that he uses this word. In essence, Paul is saying when I was a child, I spoke my mind like a child. I would argue the way that child, children argue. I, I didn't have, this is what we say, I have no filter. People say I don't have no filter and they be so proud of it. I be thinking, how is that impacting your professional? What does your, what does your significant other think about this filterless lifestyle? And if that's not bad enough, there's another dimension of immaturity, which is not what I say, but who I say it to. See, you and I exhibit speaking like a child, not only when we say what is not appropriate to say, we exhibit speaking like a child when we share our inner thoughts with the wrong people. Tell somebody, watch your mouth. See, see, I need you guys to understand, right, that, that, that every one of us, more than likely, if you haven't, all right then. But every, every one of us, more than likely, have shared something with someone only for them to fashion it into a weapon that they were able to then use against you. You ever had somebody take your words and turn them into a shiv? See, see, I need you to understand, right, that if you've never been in a situation, then that's great. But for some of us, we've divulged our deepest, darkest details only to be manipulated by them later. And so the type of speaking that Paul is saying that we must mature in is the way we disclose our thoughts, and even as important, who we disclose our thoughts to. See, everyone does not need to know what it is that you think. Everyone should not be provided with privilege to being privy to what you ponder in your private time. Next time you want to give someone a piece of your mind, I want you to consider that if you would not let them in your house, that you should not let them in your head. See, see, because what happens sometimes is we get frustrated in conversations with people and then we begin divulging things that we ought not divulge. We begin saying things that we ought not say. And then we try to backtrack and say, I ain't really mean it. But you did, though. If nothing else in that moment, you meant it. If, if, if you only meant it as a weapon. 
because it may not have been true, but it was the right weapon in my arsenal for me to use against you. And so, so I need you guys to understand the Bible tells us to keep your heart with all diligence for out of it springs the issues of life. But I need you guys to see what Jesus said as a connection to our words and who we are. Because another aspect is that you cannot disconnect who you are from how you speak. Can I show it to you? Matthew chapter 12, starting at 33, it says, and this is Jesus speaking. He says, either make the tree good and his fruit good or else make the tree bad and his fruit bad. For a tree is known by his fruit. Then he says, brood of vipers. How can you being evil speak good things? For out of the abundance of the heart, the mouth speaks. A good man out of the good treasure of his heart brings forth good things. And an evil man out of the evil treasure brings forth evil things. But I say to you that every idle word men may speak, they will give account of it in the day of judgment. For by your words, you will be justified. And by your words, you will be condemned. That means that you cannot use your words as weapons intending to wound and hurt other people, but claim to be a good person. Because Jesus said either make the tree good or make the tree evil, but it can't be both. And then he connects your words because your words are seeds and what you say takes root in other people and the root grows. And for this reason, our final point, if you take points, you'll want to get this one. Think before you speak. See, Paul says, when I was a child, I spoke as a child. I said whatever I thought without regard. I spoke my mind, whether provoked or unprovoked. I spoke as a child. In our maturity, it is time for us to use what I describe as qualified communication. Will you say teach, Pastor? See, qualified communication is that I think before I speak. And I found this really cool acronym for think. Some of you may have seen it. But think is broken down in an, in an acronym so that you can think before you speak. Because a lot of us say things out of our mouths and when it's coarse or when it's bad, when it's hurtful, when it's mean, when it's downright trifling, we, we follow up in our loyalty to dysfunction by saying, I mean, but it's the truth. You ever had somebody, it's the truth you? But it's the truth. And I need you to understand that it's the truth is an excellent place to start, but it's an inappropriate place to end. Can I give you the acronym for think? Will you put it up for me? See, think tells you to first ask yourself if it's true, because if it's a lie, there's nothing else to discuss. But after acknowledging the fact that what it is that you have to say out of your mouth is true, you need to then ask yourself, is it helpful? Am I helping anybody by saying this thing? And then if you've decided that it is indeed helpful, because I need you to understand when we say, let me help you. It does not always mean be helpful. Sometimes we don't follow up after let me help you because, I, you know, you, let me help you. What it is, let me help you never cross this line with me again. Let me help you not get your face smashed in. Let me help you. Y'all don't know people that talk like that. It's okay. I know y'all saved, sanctified, full of the Holy Ghost, but I know some, I know some people that when they say, let me help you, the last thing they about to give you is help. You start with, is it true? You follow up with, is it helpful? And then it gets real interesting. Is it inspiring? Not is it corrective? Is it? Is it something that is not only true, but it is helpful and is going to inspire better behavior from the person? And if that is true, if you've got something that's true and helpful and inspiring, then the question is, but is it necessary? This is going to kill a lot of y'all's conversation, I promise you. Because a lot of what we're saying out of our mouth don't be necessary at all. And then the last part is the package that you place it in. So I got truth. I got helpful truth. I got inspiring truth. And I got necessary truth. But I got to make sure that it's kind truth. I've got to make sure that no matter what it is that I deliver, that I deliver it in a language that's called love. And so I'm going to think 
before I speak. Will you stand with me?